Zdravo. Pozdravljeni na dogodku Glednica v Lagerintu, v organizaciji Zdravstva Iskra. Ta dogodek je, ki smo po malce vojni dogodek, namenjen je predvsem v predstavitvi naše nove spletne regije in terenom, na katerih smo prejšnji tekni pogavili peto šest mandačnih predstavkov. Gre za spletno regijo, ki se je izkušala vparjati predvsem z socialistično perspektivo aktualnih dogodkov in z ne tako neizjemno obsežnimi analizami. Za ta dogodek smo pa na svetu ne zapravičen, pred enim mestem, ki smo dogodili dali ven, je bilo rečeno, da bo post Kevin Owenen, novinar iz Velike Britanije, ki se zdaj živi v Grči, žal ni imal priti zaradi bistvu nenadne bolezni, ampak smo uspeli v zelo hitem času dobiti do svojemu zamenjavo. Z mano tu stoji Stasis Kovelatis, ki je profesor filozofije na Geek's College v Londonu, je pa predvsem za nas zanimiv za to, ker je že od 15. leta aktivno v radikalni levi sceni v Grči in zdaj nekaj časa že tudi v Franciji. Bil je član CITIZE do poleta 2015, se pravi, da kratko je CITIZA sprejela diktat Evropske unije in podpisala memorandum. Sedaj je član od cepenega kvila CITIZE ljudske enotnosti. Tu je pa danes zato, da nam bo veliko šita, da bo nekaj povedal o globalnem kontekstu, v katerem se nahajamo danes in o možnosti za preseganje nekih konkretnih omenitev, ki nas pestijo, tako iz stališča organizacijskega vprašanja, kot iz stališča političnega vprašanja. Sem to še na začetku pomembno profesor malo uvoda, potem bomo imeli en voden pogovor, čisto na koncu bo pa vizualen pogovor, pa tri četiri ure časa za vprašanja, tako da prosim, če bi to na kako vprašanje, naj si jih predtem pripravi, bomo potem lahko pa provoditi diskusijo. Hvala. Thanks. Right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure for me to be, to be here. Can, can you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah? Uh, so it's a, great, it's a great pleasure for me to be here for the first time in, in Ljubljana and in, in the country. Um, I have to say that, although it's obvious, of course, that uh, I, I come here as a political activist, not as an academic, right? Um, and this, this is perhaps something we can talk about. Uh, later on about the, you know, how can we conceive of academia as a political space and more generally the, the type of work, of intellectual work we're trying to do uh, there and its relation to politics. But um, what I want to uh, share with you are some thoughts about the political situation in Europe today and the role that uh, the Greek experience of which uh, I was a uh, part, because that was also the first moment in my life, I think, that Bojida uh, said a few things about this um, just uh, a second ago, uh, that I was part of that as not only an active member of Syriza, but as part of the leadership of Syriza, as being a member of the Central Committee of the Party between 2012 and the summer of 2015. Um, so, uh, I will start with some more general uh, thoughts about the European situation focused on the recent events in Italy and then go to, uh, to the Greek uh, case focusing more particularly on the 2015 crucial moment of the first six to seven months to, uh, of Syriza being in government. Of course, during the discussion we will certainly cover other aspects of those events as well and we go we will also go closer to the present. So, uh, let me start with, with, uh, with Italy. I've, I've, uh, I'm starting with Italy for two reasons. The first is that it's next door, literally, to share a border with Italy. And the second is that uh, Italy is probably now the weak link, as we say, in Europe. The way Greece was the weak link of uh, Europe between uh, 2010 and 2000, 2015 included. Uh, you have a, uh, the weak link means that 
contradictions of the conjunctural concentrate in a, and take a specific form actually in a specific place and at a specific moment. So what is at stake there is of a broader significance uh, than uh, just uh, uh, the domestic affairs of that uh, specific country, although Italy is of course a very important country for the political equilibrium in Europe more generally. So what I want to suggest is that the, the ingredients uh, we are seeing unfolding in the Italian situation uh, are to a very large extent the same ones that we found in Greece in the previous sequence, but also the same ones that we find elsewhere, and this is why they really are just a kind of accentuated or exacerbated form of uh, the European conjunction. The case, uh, the, 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 the Italy as a kind of exemplification of the European crisis uh, is even a more remarkable case than Greece if you think that it is not only a much bigger country with a much bigger economy, the third economy in continental Europe, but also because the political developments of Italy uh, have at least two sharp differences compared to Greece. Uh, the first is that, at least so far, there hasn't been any so-called bailout program uh, of which, uh, to which Greece had been, uh, has been subjected since 2010. Uh, so the bailout programs, which meant that you know, loans were given to Greece with very strict conditionalities and the country was put under the tutelage of uh, the so-called Troika, uh, of the European institutions, the European Central Bank, the European Commission, and the International Monetary F uh, Fund. Uh, Greece was not unique in this case. Uh, other countries of the European periphery were subjected to similar type of programs, uh, mo most uh, uh, notably uh, Ireland and uh, Portugal. But Italy has never been uh, subjected to such a bailout, at least so far, although its economic uh, situation is quite dire. But no Troika regime in Italy. The second thing, to which of course I will uh, come back a bit uh, further, is that the, the response to that situation of crisis in Italy doesn't come from the right, but uh, no, doesn't come from the left, but for, from the right, and even from this very bizarre uh, combination of the alliance between a party of the hard right, uh, xenophobic racist party like uh, uh, the Lega, and uh, this, this kind of sui generis populism of uh, the Five Stars uh, movement. Now, if we try now to focus, you know, to zoom a bit closer to um, the formation, uh, the ongoing formation of the, of the Italian government and how things look like now, what do we see? What are the main elements? The first is that uh, the program, the, co the contract of government uh, signed between these two formations uh, is already appears as a scandal uh, in the eyes of uh, the European institution and of, uh, and of the other, the rest of the European uh, governments. Uh, this program is a strange mixture of uh, neoliberal measures and social measures, if we uh, look at uh, the socio-economic uh, agenda. And that strange mix mixture nevertheless marks a break with uh, the, the mold uh, of uh, EU policies uh, as <coughs> they are now. Uh, so, <coughs> the two parties have agreed on the fact that the so-called fiscal consolidation, so budgetary de deficits will definitely be put aside. Uh, they have a, pro a program not only of not implementing cuts, which are at the order of the day, but on the contrary, increasing uh, uh, public uh, demands. Uh, public spending, public expenditure, and at the same time, they want to reduce taxes, and this is the most specifically neoliberal part of their program, by instituting a so-called flat tax, uh, 15 to 20 percent to all types of incomes, uh, so abolish, you know, the progressive taxation of, uh, of, of, of revenues, um, except from the very low uh, bracket of the, uh, of the income. Uh, on the social side, they want to institute a minimum income, uh, quite low, but you know, it still makes a difference where, uh, in a country where uh, poverty and unemployment, particularly the southern part, are very high. But the minimum income was one of the key uh, measures proposed by uh, the Five Stars movement since its um, 
creation, and they want to slash the, the extremely unpopular and antisocial pension reform, the Fornero so-called uh, reform, that was put in place by the Monti government in uh, 2012. But, and this also has to be said, uh, they want to slash this pension uh, reform, which, is, which if implemented would be a very popular measure, of course, at the same time they would keep uh, the very anti-social reform of the labour legislation put in place by the Renzi government, the famous Jobs Act, huh? this is how it was labelled in Italian, <coughs> if I may say so, uh, and the very reactionary reform of education that was put in place by uh, the governments before even uh, Renzi. Uh, so that's, that's the first part, uh, the break with the orthodoxy of economic policies as they are implemented now by that strained mixture of uh, neoliberalism and with, with a, a touch of social measures. The second part is um, a discourse very clearly centered on uh, the nation and even on nationalism. Priority to the Italians, uh, like Salvini, the leader of the Lega, uh, said. Uh, clearly imitating Trump's uh, discourse, uh, America first, uh, so it's Italy first. Uh. Um, this priority to Italy and to Italians, uh, this Italy first uh, type of slogan, clearly has an anti-EU edge. Uh. Uh, what unites uh, these two parties is a common hostility to European to the European Union, which we can label either as Euroscepticism or even uh, in some fringes, at least of those parties, a desire to break uh, with the EU. There was even talk of exiting the Euro during the negotiations leading to the formation of the government. There was a leak of a draft of the, of, of the agreement in which this mention was, was mentioned, uh, but it was probably much more to give a frisson uh, to the um, uh, European uh, establishment, because it was that particular measure was very quickly withdrawn, uh, taken out of the, of the table. Um, the third element, uh, which is quite striking, I think, in this um, program of government, is the strong anti-migrant policies. Huh? Uh, the measure they want, to, they are putting forward, is to deport. Uh, half a million migrants uh, from, uh, from Italy. And, uh, what is here, although anti-migrant discourse and this type of measures in various forms are of course a common pattern across the board of uh, the European right and even right-wing populist parties or dubious catch-all populist parties like the uh, Cinque Stelle, the five stars in, in Italy, However, in Italy, it's quite clear that there is something specific about the situation that has to do with the status of Italy, a status which it shares with Greece, of uh, having become uh, the border guard of the European uh, Union, uh, the entrance gate uh, to Europe, particularly after the closure of the route that was going through Greece, uh, after the agreement between uh, the EU and uh, Turkey, the flux of uh, migrants increased uh, via Italy, increased even more. And uh, uh, the way these things are regulated by uh, Europe uh, is that the countries of the periphery are really transformed into border guards, uh, into a kind of wall which surrounds fortress Europe and prevents uh, the countries of the European core from dealing directly, physically, I mean, with the issue. Itself, huh? So it's both a wall, a wall means a filter actually, and a trap in which uh, the migrants or a disproportionate numbers of them are somehow uh, kept. And this is of course a very, an increasingly I would say important element of the ongoing European crisis. Huh? We should understand that the EU is not just a mechanism implementing hardline neoliberal policies, it is not only a mechanism uh, that is destroying any notion of democratic and popular control in uh, the, 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 member, in the member countries. It is also fortress Europe, uh, which uh, builds a wall uh, turned against an undeclared war, actually, declared against uh, those who try to reach Europe coming from uh, the global south or from the, the, the area south of uh, Europe. Uh, a wall and a fortress that have 
led to the Mediterranean RC uh, transformed into the biggest liquid graveyard in uh, European history. Uh, the figures, uh, the estimates of the number of deaths in the Mediterranean from the mid 90s up to now are of at least 30,000 people who have died. These are who are counted, and probably the real figure is uh, the double or the triple of this. So let me list quickly now the ingredients uh, that I have just mentioned. Uh. We have, I would say, in Italy, three types of revolts or reactions that are expressed in uh, this programmatic alliance, as I have um, uh, I have mentioned before. The first is the revolt against austerity and the orthodox economic policies that have been relentlessly implemented, actually even before uh, the 2008 crisis, but with renewed energy and harshness uh, since the start of the crisis, with the hardening even of that straight jacket with you know, the new treatises like uh, uh, the treatise on the euro stability, for instance, uh, the six-pack and the two-pack, I mean, a whole set of European regulations that have made the, the straitjacket of austerity and neoliberal measures uh, even, more, um, even more tight. This is of particular importance in Italy, which, although not having experienced a kind of crash, uh, an economic collapse like the Greek one, is nevertheless a country which uh, is in a long-term economic stagnation since at least a couple of decades. Huh? If you look at the figures, it's quite impressive. Huh? The Italian GDP now is almost identical, has only slightly moved compared to the uh, uh, GDP of the early 2000s or, or late uh, 1990s, with, of course, all the list of consequences. We know high unemployment being uh, one of the main ones. Secondly, we have the revolt against the denial of democracy as crystallized in the institutions of the uh, European Union. And here again, Italy is a particularly important case, and this is something that is very often overlooked outside of Italy. Although, as I said before, Italy hasn't been under a Troika regime and other kind of institutionalized tutelage the, the way Greek was, uh, Greece was and, and remains, uh, it nevertheless experienced simultaneously as, as Greece, uh, the first wave, if I may say so, of European coup. I mean, in 2012, if you, if you remember, the Greek Prime Minister, uh, George Papandreou, after being publicly humiliated at the Cannes uh, Euro Summit in France and experiencing upheaval and revolt in his own country, resigned. And the following government was a so-called technocratic government of all the mainstream parties at the time, Social Democratic Party, the right, and uh, even the far right, actually, uh, party of the time, led by a Greek banker and former uh, important figure of uh, Goldman Sachs, um, Mr. Lucas Papademos in, in Greece. Huh? The Italian equivalent of that was the resignation of Berlusconi at the demand of the EU and after all the machinations of the EU, and the formation of a technocratic government under Mario Monti. And this experience of Mario Monti implementing one of the most brutal, a series of very brutal neoliberal reforms without any kind of democratic legitimacy and clearly being put in place by the European institutions is a very lively uh, experience in, uh, in Italy, it is a very lively moment in Italian political life, and if you follow, which is something I'm doing, the discourse, the anti eu discourse of both the Cinque Stelle and uh, the Lega is very much fueled by uh, this uh, experience of, and this rejection of Monti, one of the most unpopular prime ministers in the entire Italian history. Finally, the third revolt is uh, the revolt uh, against the transformation of the European, of the southern European periphery into uh, the border guard of Europe, uh, its position as uh, the border guard in the division of labor and of tasks that has been put in place by the whole institutional and police framework of uh, Fortress Europe. Now, all these elements, uh, all these three revolts, uh, were already fueling the dynamic of the situation in Greece. 
the exception, of course, is that in Greece, uh, the uh, reply to that crisis, uh, starting in 2010 uh, uh, and reaching its climactic moment, it probably in the two or three years that followed uh, 2010, uh, came from the left. Why? Uh, I'll come to the serious part of the story, to the more political, if you like, part of the story in, in ju ju just a few moments, but uh, we should keep in mind the following things. Uh, uh, Greece and Spain, between 2010 and 2012 included, in those three crucial years, uh, experienced the biggest wave of popular mobilization uh, in Europe in the last couple of decades, and even compared to the standards of these countries, uh, which have both of them strong traditions of popular struggles and mobilizations, the biggest mobilization since the 1970s. Huh? And, and the falls were quite similar in both countries. Huh? Occupation of the squares huh? with Indignados in uh, uh, Spain and uh, the movement of uh, the squares in Greece. And this fueled a left wing and a dynamic in both countries, huh? expressed by Podemos, the formation of a new formation of the, uh, of, of the radical left. We can discuss about Podemos. Uh, later on, and with the sudden rise of an, of an already existing uh, party of the radical left, Syriza, in, uh, in Greece. Huh? So the role of popular mobilization is of course a crucial parameter in understanding the dynamic of these two situations. What we can see now, and I think that the weight of the defeat of Syriza in Greece counts a lot in this, uh, evolution is the fact that it is the right that has taken the initiative. And we can see that in Italy, uh, with you know, the, the left in all its forms, uh, even in the extremely diluted form of the so-called democratic uh, party of the, of the centre-left, and the radical left has uh, evaporated since a uh, while now. Uh, Italy is a particularly striking example of this, but Britain is another one, with the Brexit vote dominated by a very right-wing uh, discourse and forces around Brexit. Huh? So we can also discuss this a bit later. I don't consider Brexit as such as a, as a disaster, quite the contrary actually, but we should be quite clear that the Brexit campaign was overwhelmingly dominated by the xenophobic uh, and racist uh, and racist right. Um, so uh, this evolution in Italy is uh, particularly impressive if you consider that Italy was one of the most pro-European, in the sense of pro-EU, uh, countries in the entire continent. Huh? It was, if there was one matter of consensus at all levels of Italian public life, it was a very strong support for the European Union, until quite recently, actually. And this, uh, across the border, uh, and, and, prob and not probably, certainly much more so on the left part of the spectrum than on the right part of the spectrum. And this is another key to uh, the explanation of the situation. Huh? What we see in Italy with uh, this new government and this new uh, balance of forces, what we see in Britain with Brexit, what we have seen developing in Greece in the previous uh, sequence is a revolt, a popular revolt and a popular rejection of the European Union for the, mentions, for the reasons I have mentioned, particularly the countries of the, of, of the periphery. Uh, and the race between political forces who are able or not to express and articulate somehow this uh, revolt against uh, the European Union within the broader uh, framework of revolt against uh, orthodox uh, neoliberal uh, policies. And, and we have to be clear that particularly after 2015 and Syriza's capitulation to the European Union, it is the right that has taken the initiative. If you don't do the job, or if you prove that you have been unable to deal with this, then someone else will do uh, the job in, uh, in your place. Now, I will be briefer than I thought about Greece in order you know, not to be too long in my introduction, and just you know, mention a few bullet points about the political reasons of the Greek, uh, of the Greek disaster. So, I don't know how familiar you are with the Greek situation, but as a brief reminder, the Greek crisis starts in 2010, when Greece enters the regime of the Troika. Huh? Uh, bailouts, loans, shock therapy, 
of an unseen magnitude in any, in any Western uh, European, uh, European country. The country has entered since an, an economic recession that is also unseen in any Western capitalist country in, in history, actually. Yeah? It's even uh, more serious uh, and more protracted than the 1930s recession of, let's say, the US or Germany, yeah? the two countries where uh, the recession was, uh, the 1930s crisis was uh, the most, um, was the worst, hit the worst. Um, in 2012, in the, the elections of 2012, the old political system in Greece collapses. And the, at the epicenter of that political collapse is the collapse of Greek social democracy, yeah, which was the dominant party actually in the entire period of the country following the fall of the military dictatorship in 1974. Uh, the, the socialists ruled the country most of the time between the early 80s, 1981, and 2012, actually, with brief, relatively brief interludes of conservative uh, rule. Social democracy collapses, and Syriza, a party which so far got about 4%, 4 to 5% of the vote, uh, became uh, the biggest opposition party and actually missed. Uh, a relative majority in 2012 by only 2%, 2 percent, uh, 2 uh, points uh, behind the parliamentary right. So the three years that followed 2012 and 2015 are those absolutely crucial years if we want to understand the evolution of Syriza and how in the way the terrain was prepared for the capitulation, although Syriza itself became the terrain of an internal and battle of broader significance between various options actually on how to deal with um, what was ahead and what was ahead from that moment onwards clearly was that Syriza was a government in waiting. Uh, indeed, what was, could be easily predicted happened in 2015 in the January elections where, uh, well, for the first time in post-war European history, a party of the radical left rooted in the communist tradition of the country, the country which has experienced a civil war, uh, the second uh, Western uh, European country with Spain uh, that had uh, such an experience in its uh, relatively recent uh, past, uh, won elections, nearly had an absolute majority in terms of seats, only one seat below the uh, absolute majority, and formed a government with a small uh, party of uh, the so-called sovereignist but anti-Troika right, the, uh, the so-called independent Greeks. We can come to that uh, point uh, later on. Syriza won the elections because uh, it succeeded uh, and, and, and crystallized hopes both in Greece and abroad outside uh, of, of Greece in much broader layers of the European public and particularly of the European left and beyond Europe probably. Uh, for two reasons, or three if you like. The first is because uh, it appeared as being a party understanding, respecting, listening to and both intervening the social movements and the broad popular mobilizations that happened in Greece between 2010 and 2012. And that made, for instance, a crucial difference between Syriza and the party that was dominating the Greek radical left until that moment both electorally and in terms of membership, and actually even more in terms of membership than uh, in terms of than in electoral terms, the Communist Party of Greece, a very Stalinist or neo-Stalinist uh, rather uh, party, but uh, uh, which played an important role in, in uh, Greek politics until uh, that moment. The second reason is, of course, that Syriza won on the basis of a program which addressed the central issue of the country of Greek society at that moment, huh? ending uh, the Troika regime, reversing uh, the uh, shock uh, therapy, breaking with uh, uh, the, the, the kind of you know, new reality that in a very violent way uh, was imposed by the Troika, with the collaboration, of course, of the Greek political elite and the Greek uh, dominant, uh, dominant class, which once again in its history needed this kind of external uh, support in order to continue ruling the country and uh, keeping its, its class power uh, intact. The third reason, but related to these two things, is that Syriza won on the basis of the unitary proposal of the left. Huh? 
this, the anti-sectarian and unitary approach of Syriza was particularly crucial in inspiring hope uh, and uh, winning somehow new layers of, of voters and new sectors of, of Greek society. When, in 2012, when the, the kind of shift happened in the electorate, or crystallized rather in the electorate in the wake of the mobilizations, what inspired people was that the proposal of Syriza was not just, yes, we want to be in office in order to break with this uh, uh, existing uh, situation. It was, we want a unitary government of the anti-austerity left. And the fact that the Communist Party and the far-left coalition refused to enter into the, in, into the discussion uh, explains to a very large extent the reasons of their political marginalization and impotence in, in, in the next period. Now, why did that big hope fail and led to a disaster? And here, I don't have time to develop that now, but we have to explain in a way two enigmas, if you like. Huh? The first is the reason of the capitulation of Alexis Tsipras seven months after winning office huh? in July 2015, seeing, signing a new memorandum in an absolute continuity with the two Memoranda. The memoranda are the contracts signed for the bailout programs between the Greek governments and, and, and the Troika. So a third one was signed and passed uh, in Parliament by Tsipras and the majority of his party. All those of us who disagreed, either in Parliament or in the party, left Syriza at that moment and many of us uh, constituted a new uh, political formation uh, called uh, Popular Unity. Now, with, with, with other uh, organizations and groups of, 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 of the radical left. The second enigma, which is perhaps even more serious than the first one, is that it is this government, uh, it is a series of government, I mean, which since the September of that year, new elections uh, were held in September 2015, uh, won by Syriza, again, with a similar percentage of votes, but with a very low participation from now in the elections. It is this government that has been implementing, without any internal differentiation or loss, uh, the harshest neoliberal measures of that entire period of shock therapy. So it's a party coming from the radical left that not only has capitulated, but has been implementing relentlessly the very policy of its former adversaries. Huh? It has been, and has become the privileged vehicle for implementing and doing that with much less frictions, with much less reactions than its predecessors. And this is the second enigma, of course, that we have to explain. And you understand that the combination of these two things makes a, a very toxic and, let's be clear, a very depressing huh? uh, package. Uh, the reason of that capitulation can be um, uh, summed up, I think, relatively easily. Uh, Syriza came to office with a program that involved uh, an all-out, absolutely predictable confrontation with the institutions of the European Union and the dominant classes of its uh, own country, and failed completely to uh, be equipped properly to uh, win that confrontation, and even in a way to start it properly. The reasons for that is that during this intermediate period between 2012 and 2015, Syriza had already, I mean the leadership of Syriza, had already started drifting towards a form of political moderation uh, that involved uh, repeatedly refusing to consider the possibility of a break with the European institutions and particularly with the euro, the common currency. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning the euro is because it played uh, the central role in, in the whole thing, because it is the weapon of the currency, the weapon of the, the monetary weapon, that was used by the European institutions from the outset to uh, smash uh, the Greek uh, government and to force it to capitulation. Uh, only a few days, nine days after the elections, five days after the formation of the first. Uh, series of government, the European Central Bank 
decided to cut the main channel providing liquidity to the Greek banking system, leading to a gradual asphyxiation of the Greek economy, uh, emptying out uh, the, public, uh, the public coffers. All this was totally uh, predictable. Uh, the Syriza government refused to elaborate any alternative plan, the so-called Plan B, that inevitably would involve breaking with uh, uh, the euro, uh, and uh, that proved absolutely fatal after the most decisive moment of the crisis. It was reached after the referendum of July 2015. Cyprus decided for reasons that once again I don't have time to develop now, we can discuss them uh, later on. Uh, he called the referendum to allow the Greek people to express their views on an austerity package that was much lighter than the memorandum he signed a week after the referendum. In that referendum, which happened under unseen, unprecedented in, U in recent European history uh, conditions, with the banks closed, with people being unable to withdraw more than 20 euros uh, from uh, the ATM uh, machines, with liquidity running completely out, that right? was uh, after a few days uh, uh, after the, the, the referendum, and still 63% uh, of the Greek people under these conditions of blackmail and economic war said no uh, to, this, um, uh, to this austerity, to the so-called Juncker, uh, Juncker plan. Syriza capitulated and Cyprus capitulated signing up a new referendum only a week later because he had, in a way, it is true that he had no other option, but he came to that because he has refused to consider any alternative plan, any measure of self-defense, uh, uh, and he opposed a significant sector of, of his own part of Syriza, of which I was uh, also a part, uh, that was saying, this will happen, we need to elaborate, we need to have a plan B, we need to respond uh, to the way we will be uh, confronted. And in order to do that, and this is the second point, of course, we need to rely on popular mobilization. Popular mobilization is the second uh, terrain on which uh, series are failed. And once again, the preparation for that was happened in the period between 2012 and 2015. From that moment onwards, when Syriza became the biggest opposition party, uh, its own practice vis-à-vis -vis society and internally changed, and, be and it became a party increasingly centered around parliamentary tactics, uh, minimizing the role of social movements and popular mobilization, and changing its own internal structure, uh, transforming what was until then broadly speaking, a part of the militant left, into an electoral machine centered around its leader, centered around its, its, its leader and uh, entirely oriented towards uh, winning um, elections and electoral, uh, and electoral majorities. Uh, the, the, and this will be my conclusion, of course, we will develop more of this, uh, uh, more of this in, the, in, in the discussion. Um, the lessons I want to uh, draw from this are twofold, uh, threefold rather. First of all, I'm repeating what, I, what I've already said. Uh, one of the reasons of the crisis of the left in the current, in the last sequence, one of the reasons of its impotence and, in, and its inability to intervene efficiently in the situation, one of the main reasons explaining why radicalized forces of the right are on the initiative now at, at the European level is its inability to articulate a left-wing critique of the European Union and elaborating a concrete plan of breaking with the existing, with this existing structure. On the contrary, the left has been constantly cultivating illusions that it is possible to change things while remaining in a framework that, as we have seen it, and this is one of the main lessons of the Greek uh, crisis, cannot be changed from within, cannot be reformed from within, because it has been designed, actually, uh, to be unreformable uh, from within. The second aspect of, uh, the second strategic les lesson for me is that uh, the, the second reason of the, the inability, very closely linked to the first, of the left to uh, intervene in the situation, is its inability to articulate 
adequately the national level with the supranational, international, or European level, you can call it whatever you like. Huh? It's uh, the capacity, it's inability to understand that in order to break with the current state of affairs, you need to start somewhere. And the, the site where you start is the national level. Because it is at the national level that political power and the fundamental balance between social forces is validated. Uh, and political parties and political formations first and foremost uh, compete and uh, uh, wage a battle to win governmental power, and if they are on the left, as uh, a mediation towards a deeper social change in their own country. This doesn't mean at all, quite the contrary actually, that uh, we dissociate or distance ourselves from internationalist perspective. There is no genuine left-wing project without internationalism. But internationalism remains an empty word if it is confused with any loyalty to the existing uh, EU institutions. Institutions that are intrinsically in their, in their, in their DNA uh, built against any notion of democratic control and with uh, along a very hardline uh, neoliberal agenda enshrined in the European uh, treatises. And the third and last uh, lesson for me to be drawn is about the political tool itself. Huh? One of the reasons of our own failure as a left wing of Syriza is that we didn't pay enough attention to the transformation of our own party, to the way things were changing inside you know, our own home, in a way. And we were outflanked uh, by a leadership that was drifting towards the logic of, you know, staying in power at any cost, even including uh, uh, applying and putting into practice the policies of its uh, adversaries, because it has succeeded in somehow changing to a significant level, although not completely, uh, the internal functioning and the internal logic of that uh, political uh, of that political tool. And these are, according to me, the three challenges to which uh, any force of the radical and anti-capitalist left should be able to respond uh, in order to uh, get out, actually, of the current uh, deadlock that uh, we have seen developing, um, I think, nearly everywhere in our, in our continent. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. 
Um, right, okay, so the, the EU is obviously uh, uh, a central issue, and I said that in my uh, introductory uh, talk, and the, the failure of, of, of the left and its incapacity to be up to the situation is particularly obvious in that, um, in, in that respect. Um, let me mention a few elements. First of all, the central periphery contradiction. We have to understand that uh, the deeper logic of economic integration at the economic level uh, has led, and this can be empirically proven, of, although of course we are all experiencing it in our daily lives, uh, not, to the, not to bridging the gap between the various U European countries, but on the contrary, widening the gap between those countries. Uh, this was partly concealed during, before the 2008 crisis uh, because of the phenomena of the bubbles developing in the periphery. And th there were variants of the bubble, uh, but it, of course, as you understand, it's not an accident if um, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland experienced similar situations, and three of those four countries were subjected, actually, to bailouts and to uh, shock versions of, of, of shock therapy. Uh, it is because they experienced a form of growth before that was a kind of unsustainable way to catch up the widening gap between uh, the periphery and the core countries. Everyone understands that the way Germany dominates the European Union, when I'm saying Germany, I mean German capital. Huh? We have to be clear about this. I don't mean the German people. On the contrary, German workers and wage earners have suffered enormously by this strategy. The wages and salaries in Germany are blocked since years huh? now. This is one of the main reasons of German competitiveness. But it's not the only one. Huh? The euro is designed in a way to help the German export machine. It has, a, it, it, it has actually allowed the German export machine to be built. Huh? And these record surpluses of Germany, inevitably, in an area with a common currency, means that you know, other countries will experience deficits huh? in their current accounts, in their trade balance, uh, and so on. And this uh, uh, is exactly what happened to uh, Greece, uh, as it happens to Italy, as it happens to Spain, uh, and so on. And these countries become over indebted. And since the way to cover public debt, as it is designed by the European institutions, is exclusively via loans in the financial markets, you know that the European Union has forbidden domestic loans, domestic financing of the public debt the way it existed before uh, the currency uh, unification, uh, inevitably means that the most fragile countries in a situation of crisis are exposed to the most aggressive forms of pressure of financial markets. And the, 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 the next step is, of course, the bailout programs that we have seen developing. Yeah? So economically speaking, the center periphery, uh, the combined and uneven development, uh, as we say in a certain Marxist tradition to which I, uh, I belong, is uh, a fundamental part of that capitalist uh, machine uh, and the way it has crystallized. Uh. The second aspect is uh, the fact that what we have seen in the Greek crisis is, you know, the, the, the classic definition of the sovereign power uh, given by the German uh, Nazi theorist, actually, Carl Schmitt, that uh, the sovereign is the, the, the instance that decides in an exceptional situation, uh, in a situation of suspension, in a way, of the previous coordinates of the situation. Well, in, in Greece, we have seen that. Huh? The, the Greek crisis, uh, uh, although a crisis of a small country, but was threatening uh, the whole equilibrium of Europe. And what was the instance that clearly appeared as the sovereign decision in Greece? The European Central Bank. The, the European Central Bank was the central war machine against the first series of government. And before Greece, Greece was not the first, actually, to. And we, we, inside Syriza, we had long debates about this. Before Greece, we had Cyprus. Uh, uh, Cyprus is a, very, is a country even smaller than Slovenia, huh, by the way. A third of Slovenia, if you can, uh, if you can imagine. It is remarkable, however, because, um, uh, in, in, that, in that respect, because uh, uh, it also faced uh, a problem with its banking system. Uh, the European Union proposed a bailout along similar lines with the, the, the Greek Troika 
program. It was unanimously rejected by the Cypriot parliament. Huh? And there is a very strong Cypriot left, essentially, by, dominated by the, uh, the, the, the local communist party of, of Cyprus. Uh, but it was unanimously rejected by all parties. Uh, the European Central Bank gave, I, I think, five days to uh, the Cypriot parliament to change its mind. And the unanimous rejection, otherwise it would cut the liquidity. Exactly the same scenario that happened in Greece, uh, gradually from escalating from February to July 2015. And the Cypriot parliament, the same who had unanimously rejected, they unanimously accepted after five days of that blackmail, uh, the, the, the shock therapy of the, of the ECB. Um, and before Greece, we had Ireland. The, the, it, it happened behind the doors uh, in exchange of letters between uh, the governor then of the European Central Bank and the then Prime Minister of Ireland uh, uh, and around the modalities of saving uh, the banks of Ireland. Uh, so Trichet sent letters saying that you know, either we implement a harsh austerity program and you uh, accept unconditionally our, our, our package or, or you know, you would be uh, we will retaliate uh, in terms of uh, the provision of liquidity. And the European Central Bank, as you know, is independent. Independent means that it is completely unaccountable. It means <laughs> it is accountable to financial markets. It's its own objective, constitutional objective, in the sense that it is enshrined in the European treaties, is to watch over inflation. It's directly connected in all kinds of ways. I don't want to expand even if we can prove it empirically to uh, the financial markets. Huh? Suffice it to say that my drag, I mean, all, all, all the people who have been directors of the bank have, been, have worked before in uh, uh, the financial sector, usually in Goldman Sachs or Morgan Chase, I mean, the big banks of the, of the financial sector. So a completely unaccountable institution concentrates an enormous power in direct connection, in a total subservience to the interest of the dominant fraction of capital today, which is finance, obviously. And finally, the third uh, issue is that we have seen, uh, at least, you know, I deeply disagree. We can also discuss about this. I'm sure we will discuss about this later on. I totally disagree with the proposals of Yanis Varoufakis. But nevertheless, I have to recognize two things. The first is, you know, that he didn't vote. He didn't accept the capitulation of, of, of Syriza. The second is that in his narrative, uh, in his book, interviews, and, and, and so on, he gives a very clear view of what was going on you know, in the Eurogroup meetings and, 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 and in the rest, the way he was publicly humiliated, and actually Tsipras was forced you know, to kick him out of the, uh, of, as the head of the, of the negotiation team before even July, huh? and, to, and to appoint more compliant. Uh, people to go into negotiations. So it's completely impossible, the idea that, you know, by discussing and by having a democratic mandate, we would go to the European institutions and negotiate and, and they would respect, you know, the will of the Greek people and the mandate of, of, of the Greek people. Oh, all, all, all this proved totally untrue. I mean, I don't know if you remember the statement of Juncker days after the January 2015 elections. There can be no democratic decision against the European treaties. It's both, it's both astonishing in a way, but also perfectly consistent with the whole logic of um, uh, the way the European institutions have been built. They cannot be reformed because they have been designed to be unreformable. You know that in order to change a comma in the European treatises, you need to have unanimity of all the member states. So each time, you know, we have, you know, various people of the progressive left with a lot of goodwill. I'm absolutely not denying, you know, their goodwill and sincerity in some cases. I deny that in the case of Greece, because in Greece, this hypothesis has been tested in real terms. Huh? It's not blah blah anymore. Huh? It's not, you know. Uh, discussions, conferences, huh? it's, lived, it's lived experience. So you know, we have this idea, we will reform the institutions, we will have, you know, we will make the European Central Bank accountable, we will have, you know, this level of co-decision and that level of democratization and that measure of, of, of transparency. And all this is clearly, you know, people who are, who know about European institutions just laugh, huh? It happens via accidents of institutional careers and so on that part of my job at King's College is, is based at, at the European Studies Department in which I, 
I'm supposed to give you know, kind of political theory that um, I think is closer to France Fanon than to uh, Jean Monnet. Um, uh, uh, however, I have colleagues who you know, work for European institutions, who get a lot of money for European institutions, and who are very integrated in the whole machinery of the European Union. And I have to say that these colleagues were much more lucid than my progressive and left-leaning colleagues because they knew that all this talk and all these naive or allegedly naive beliefs or series about changing things from, from within was just a joke. And <laughs> since, you know, I had a brief moment of media glory in 2015 myself, in a sense that for the first time in my life I went on, you know, BBC, public uh, TV in, in, in various countries and, and so on. And I had interlocutors which were coming, you know, from uh, serious uh, institutions and political parties, etc. And all of them were saying, okay, uh, we succeeded venting Hollande. It took five weeks. Th that was the most clear. It was a French guy from the... Um, from the French right who told me. It took, it took five weeks for François Hollande, I elected in 2010, the former socialist president, for him to bend to the European Union. Mm, Alexis Tsipras, I would say five months, he said. He proved almost right, right? It was six months and a half, actually. Okay, okay so um, the example of this also had some echoes in the, in the European, um, in, in the frame of the European left. Um, you are also somewhat active in uh, French uh, right, uh, right to left, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you also probably have some experience with, uh, uh, with what is going now uh, on in the United Kingdom. Um, you, you were also talking um, before about the game, so I, I would like to know how, what, what, if, what, uh, what did these movements uh, learn from, from the experience and what did this mean from, from the European life? Right, thanks. Um, right, I, I'll start with an anecdote, which is something I, I try to avoid doing, but you will see that it has some, some significance. Days after the January 2015 elections, a big rally was held in central London, organized by the Greece Solidarity Campaign that was active at the time. And it happened at the central headquarters of the Trade Union Confederation of the, of the United Kingdom. So it was a big, very a big panel, big platform, we're sharing the platform with 10, 10 other people, essentially trade unionists and campaigners of, um, of Britain. And I was in daily contact with um, uh, the, the leader of the Greek Solidarity Campaign. And um, days before the short, a couple of days before the event, I asked him, you know, who will be on behalf of the Labour Party? Uh, obviously, someone from the left of, of the Labour Party. Uh, and he said, Satis, look, I'm, I'm very sorry to say, but, you know, I've tried to have Diane Abbott, I've tried... Uh, to have John McDonnell, but uh, it proved impossible, and, you know, we have the usual, the standard solution. The standard solution was Jeremy Corbyn, and Jeremy Corbyn at the time was considered as a completely marginal figure, but he was the absolutely standard speaker for any kind of events or protest or etc. in London. I mean, if you want to have something from the Labour left for anything, from a meeting of solidarity with Palestine to, you know, to campaign against racism, to the strike happening at your workplace, etc. A call to Jeremy Corbyn uh, was enough, you know, to get, to get somehow the, the, the guy, okay? So Jeremy Corbyn, uh, uh, six months less than six months before being elected leader of the Labour Party with an unprecedented level of, of, of support, was something that uh, you should have to apologize for uh, in events like this. Uh, which, means, which means that, you know, we have to be persistent. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn became the leader of the Labour Party, and I say this to counterbalance, you know, the pessimism. Uh, forced pessimism of my talk uh, based on, on the Greek experience. Jeremy Corbyn crossed a political desert, not for three years, not for ten years, but for nearly 30 years. Okay. Nearly 30 years, completely in flinching, completely impermeable to all the arguments saying that, you know, you are a dinosaur, no one is interested, etc. I've lived through the entire Blair era. I worked through the entire Blair era 
in the, in, in, in the United Kingdom. If in the 2000 years, not, not, not just months, and even months before his election, you would say Jeremy Corbyn will be the next leader of the Labour Party after Tony Blair, and, and it was fantasy. It was, you know, unimaginable. It was something that no, no one, I mean, it could only provoke laughs, I mean, big laughs. So that's one element. At the meeting, I made my usual speech, but, you know, within the line of the party. I'm very disciplined, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm a communist. I'm, I'm, I'm very disciplined in terms of, of, party, of, of party discipline. So I made the speech, but with my, you know, a kind of more combative tone, probably, than uh, some other uh, series of speakers. Jeremy Corbyn came to see me after the, after the meeting, when, you, when it was over, you know, face to face, and I still remember him, he would be my big thing, he took me by the hand like this, and he said, I really liked what you say, but tell me something, do you have a plan B? <laughs> because they will attack you immediately, and they will attack you immediately on your weak point. And your weak point is the same as our weak point when the Labour Party won in 1974 elections, with what was then its most radical and left-wing program. Uh, and he said I was a young cater and member of the Labour Party of all of the time, and I can tell you the entire story. This was Tony Benn government? No, Tony Benn was never, he was a minister of that government, he was minister of industry, it was James, it was James uh, Callan that um, was the, 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 the Prime Minister. And he said they attacked us immediately on banks. Two years after winning the election, we were forced to ask for a loan to the International Monetary Fund. The conditionalities of that loan were austerity. Austerity provoked the winter of discontent, the defeat of labor, and the, and the rise of fascism. And this is exactly when they will attack you. They will attack on the banks. So, once again, please tell me, do you have a plan B? I was very embarrassed. I have to understand. I was representing the party, and I said, look, I mean, you know, there are discussions around this issue, etc., but it would be a very nice idea if you could go to Athens and talk directly to Tsipras, not to me. I mean, I'm convinced that you know, you're right. Why I'm telling this? I'm telling this because everyone knows that, and your, your reference to Tony Benn was right, uh, Jeremy Corbyn is really the type of political cadres that the Labour left, of which Tony Benn was really the, the, the leader and, and the most noble uh, figure, uh, uh, he, he's, the, he's the product of that. And, and this political current in, in Britain is hostile to the European Union. So he was very embarrassed when he took over as the leader of the party because he knew that not only the party but a very large part of his own social base would not follow him on that terrain for a number of reasons that have to do with the broader situation of the left in Britain as elsewhere in, in, uh, in Europe. So he decided to have this kind of middle of the road attitude, he's huh? Brexit. Huh? He was formerly against Brexit, but so critical of the European Union that when you would listen to a speech of Jeremy Corbyn uh, in, in the referendum, it didn't really inspire you much huh, to vote against, uh, against the Brexit or, or, or even to participate. And what is happening after is that Jeremy Corbyn has been put, after the referendum, under an enormous pressure by the political establishment of Britain and by the right wing of his own party. I mean, the worst enemies of Jeremy Corbyn are not the Tories, Theresa May, May etc. The worst enemies are inside his party, yeah? are the Blairites and you know, all the people who have never accepted him winning the leadership of the party. All of these people say one thing to Corbyn, uh, say that you want another referendum. Uh, don't accept the result of the referendum. Say that you want another. Say that you want to reverse the referendum. Make an alliance with the Liberals and with the pro-EU part of the Tories, a kind of you know new pro, pro EU pro-Europeanist alliance. And they know that if Jeremy Corbyn did that mistake, that would lead to the defeat of Labour because it would cut Labour from a substantial part of its working class basis that voted. Um, for Brexit against the EU and, and, and uh, a large part of the trade union movement uh, as, as well, and that it would immediately lead to a drift of the program of Labour towards political moderation and the soft version of, of, of neoliberalism, the only type of policies that can be accepted by uh, the EU. So Jeremy Corbyn is one guy who 
as, as I told you, and I can prove that by less anecdotal ways, was aware of the stakes of what happened in Greece. But other things have been happening since. The most significant is Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France. Jean-Luc Mélenchon immediately called us. It's the first phone call we got. It was even before the formation of popular unity, saying, I didn't believe that Tsipras would capitulate, uh, uh, and, uh, but he did. Uh, you are right, uh, I will support you. And uh, it, it just happened that I was, for uh, some reasons, the first person to go to France, actually, at the national uh, conference of his party before the formation of um, France Insoumise, or France Insoumise in France, in the summer of 2015, to uh, carry the views of the newly born popular unity uh, at the time. So, Mélenchon has even asked for the party of the European left to expect Syriza, saying that you know, we can't accept in supposedly a European left-wing formation, a party that is implementing the harshest form of neoliberal policies ever seen in a Western country <laughs> since the war. We can't accept uh, uh, in the European left party a party that is passing anti-trade union laws uh, restricting uh, the right to strike in, uh, in, in, uh, in its own country. Uh, and Jean-Luc Mélenchon is not isolated. Jean-Luc Mélenchon has built an international alliance which includes Podemos in Spain, the left bloco in Portugal, and uh, the Red Green Alliance in Denmark, and it will be enlarged uh, and joined by many other formations of, of the radical left, and this will become, as you understand, the main European uh, at, at the European scale, the, this will become the major force in, uh, in, in the next European Parliament. And these people will make a joint list in the next European elections. And that list is explicitly one of its main objectives is the fact that we will not repeat what Tsipras did in Greece. We take the lessons. And Mélenchon's line for France, the bloc and Mélenchon is another story, La, rather, sorry, Podemos and the the Portuguese bloc are another story, particularly for them, it's more complicated. But Mélenchon's plan in France is that we have a plan A, trying to implement the measures without breaking the whole thing, uh, by just initiating a kind of chaos and instability at the level of European institutions, disobeying, as it were, unilaterally. But if needed, we have a plan B, we have to be clear about this, we have to be clear to the French people about this, and the plan B is to exit the Euro and to exit the European Union uh, via recourse to a referendum. And it is on that basis that Jean-Luc Mélenchon merely passed to the second round in the presidential election of 2015. We are not talking about the fringe, you know, marginal maverick eh, of, of the left. Eh? We are talking about a person who was only two points behind uh, the, uh, Le Pen, who uh, passed to the second round of the presidential elections. So he got the message. I have disagreements, reservations with Mélenchon for other things, but I have to admit that on this issue, he got it right. But, but this is on a policy level. What about on an organizational level? You have uh, talked that the cities had some organizational or structural problems, and uh, how what lessons were learned from this uh, example from Mélenchon or from other? Uh, you mean the populist? Uh... <laughs> well, I mean the, the radical idea, yeah, mostly, mostly the populist, because this is what you mm -hmm. Maybe you can also comment a bit on populism mm -hmm. and the method of populism. Mm -hmm. I, I gave an interview in, uh, I think it was in January 2015, uh, shortly after the uh, first uh, the, the electoral victory of series uh, to Jacobin. Um, and I, I was asked actually by the, the comrade from Jacobi who was uh, doing the interview, Sebastian Bergen, that um, uh, he said to me that there is a kind of race or competition between the Syriza model uh, and to, to put a name on it, he, it was Lanzas and uh, you know, the democratic road to socialism and this tradition of Western Marxism, let's say, leading to that uh, line of you know, combining mass struggle and uh, uh, parliamentary majorities, uh, sometimes associated with the name of uh, Eurocommunism, uh, and uh, the populist uh, model of the rising then, uh, Podemos, uh, with the cloud, with the of the cloud as its, uh, as its main reference. And um, the defeat of Syriza unleashed in a kind of negative, of course, uh, wave 
obviously in, in Europe that you know is felt uh, and uh, now even if people are not necessarily aware of that because it has very strongly discredited the idea that the radical left when accessing power is able to bring a change and break with this uh, policy framework but it has also discredited uh, the party model that Syriza represented which means a pluralist formation uniting various traditions of the radical left. Huh? Uh, Syriza was until 2013, it was created in 2004, was a coalition of different parties and organizations, it was not a unified party. And even after its foundation, 2013, as uh, a single, let's say, unified organization, it still had the internal tendencies that to a large extent reproduced the, the distinct political currents and traditions that existed before. Uh, this model of the radical uh, left was uh, in place and was the outcome of the political recomposition of the 90s and the, and the 2000 years. Huh? It's not an accident in the Bloco in Portugal, uh, to an extent the Linke uh, in Germany, um, the Red-Green Alliance in uh, Denmark, the Fondazione Comunista, when it existed as, as a mass organization in Italy, were very close uh, to that model. Uh, parties, you know, pluralist parties, in, in a kind of traditional Marxist jargon, we would call that centrist parties. Uh, centrist parties in the sense that you had more moderate and more radical currents coexisting somehow within uh, the same formation. These parties, although were usually relatively new, all of them were created in the post-Soviet I mean, in the era following the collapse of uh, uh, the Soviet bloc. Uh, all of them, nevertheless, had deep roots in the political traditions of their countries, uh, usually in a combination of the far left and the communist movement. Uh. Um, the failure of Syriza uh, gave a decisive advantage, I would say, to uh, the populist model. And this is explicitly what uh, Mélenchon tries to do. So, a party without a notion of membership, properly speaking, a party which is modeled on the basis of a permanent campaign, um, it's unclear to what extent it wants to intervene in social movements. It's interesting to see how uh, Mélenchon's movement and subordinate France, eh? France Insoumise in, in French, uh, is now both challenged by the ongoing social movements huh, in France, but nevertheless wants to intervene in them. But it, it is a party, you know, without proper membership, without intervention in the trade union movement, it's essentially an electoral machine, and of course, it is supposedly very horizontalist. Huh? Uh, there are no party congresses, there are no instances, there are no elected instances of any kind. But there is a leader. Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And uh, the leader and a very close and unelected uh, body group of people around him uh, uses a plebiscitary mechanism of which you know, online voting is uh, a, a central uh, procedure. And Podemos has been very much uh, following that model. It has been moving in that direction because Podemos started, contrary to uh, uh, Mélenchon's movement, Podemos, as you know, started as a movement regrouping grassroots activists of the indignados of the 2012 mobilization. It was a political initiative taken by Iglesias and the group of five people of um, Complutense in Madrid. But it attracted layers of the people who were active in the social movements in, in the mobilizations of the, of the indignados. Uh, it, ha it was very lively uh, at the start, and then it moved to a very Bonapartist and top-down uh, type of uh, functioning. I think, and you know, the, when Mélenchon is asked how do you justify this, he said, "Look, we are very, we are tired of uh, the the fragmentation and the fractious character of the cultures of left parties. We have to break with this. We have, we need some more homogeneity." and we need a mechanism that is oriented towards action. 
uh, no discussion, you know, it's a kind of, you know, English people would say that the no bullshit line. Huh? We are fed up with, you know, your congresses and the platforms and the fractions opposing each other. We need a kind of more efficient uh, mechanism that is oriented exclusively towards action. So it's no discussion, action. Now, how can you have, of course, from a left-wing perspective, action without discussion? It's something that personally I can't understand, but I'm, I'm, I'm paid, in a way, to talk eh? and to try to explain and to engage in conversation, so there is perhaps a professional distortion um, associated with that. But I think that, you know, there are clear limitations to that new model, and that we will see that unfolding. We are already seeing that in the case of Podemos. I mean, Podemos is undergoing a process of bureaucratization and institutional normalization in, in a fast, super speedy, fast track uh, way. But wasn't this exactly the mistake of Syriza that he didn't establish the necessary uh, uh, links with the civil society, with the, with the lively civil society, so it could oppose the dictates of the European Union? What was this a mistake and do you think that uh, Mélenchon and other uh, uh, left parties, uh, examining here uh, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, labor, uh, that they did not learn from, from this mistake? I mean, Syriza was a hybrid reality. I mean, they tried very hard uh, after 2012, when it was clear that there was, uh, it was a government in waiting, the leadership, or the majority of the leadership, because we were also in a way part of the leadership, um, they tried to reshape the party to make it a much more top-down, centralized uh, machine. Uh, they, they adopted fast-track procedures at all levels. We had only one month to prepare our founding congress, for instance, uh, which is you know unheard of in the, uh, in, in the history of the radical left. Uh, we had super plethoric um, decide deliberating instances, which means that no real deliberation can happen. And the first central committee was part of was a 300 member large central committee. I mean, you, you cannot, you are not a decision making body in that conditions. And then, you know, after a long battle, it was reduced to 200, but that was, of course, you know, still very unsatisfactory. So there was a, there was a concentration of the decision making process around the core leadership. And, and when we say around the core leadership, it was around opaque procedures and opaque groups that were ad hoc somehow put up around the, the, the leader and, and the leadership. Nevertheless, they didn't succeed radically breaking up with what Syriza was, and this is why Tsipras himself was increasingly aware that the party was becoming a hostile terrain, actually, to him. I was very impressed by the change of mood, you know, in the, in the meetings of the Central, uh, and the proceedings of the Central Committee, uh, from, you know, Tsipras, Tsipras, you know, was extremely popular, broadly speaking, in society, etc., but he was, uh, it was a completely different person internally, uh, because he knew that his uh, decisions and uh, orientations were met with very strong, with an increasing resistance, actually, inside the party. So the way that they did is that they prepared, if you like, the terrain before winning the elections to make, to build teams of people that would control the key ministries after. And, and they bypassed not only party instances, but they bypassed also the cabinet. Because, you know, the left of the party, we were present in the cabinet. Right? We had four important ministries. Uh, in, our, in, our, in our hands. And there were other people that were close to us in the cabinet. It is also quite clear, by the way, from Varoufakis' narrative. And Varoufakis bears a big responsibility in this because he totally played the game of having a direct face to face relation with Alexis. You know, I will talk to Alexis, I will convince Alexis, I will discuss with Alexis. I don't give a shit about parties, central committees, instances, all this, on, you know. Uh, totally, you know, uh, uh, they, they are just, uh, they, can, they can only block things uh, and, and so on, and the program of the party, etc. He starts his book by explaining how he was recruited by Tsipras and the close circle of people around him to implement a policy that was very significantly different from the program defended by the party and the program that was. Uh, you know, addressed to the Greek people and for which the Greek people voted. Huh? So um, it shows that, you know, something was going wrong uh, already uh, at the time. 
Nevertheless, there was, uh, the, so the insulated, you know, the key decision-making centers, both from the cabinet and from the party instances uh, even more, and they were able to bypass us when it came to the crucial moment of the, of the decision with a capital T, if you like, eh, which was July 2015. So we were impotent because we were actually potentially in a majority with, within the party instances, but those party instances were deprived of any real power. Uh, we experienced that in, at the end of July 2015. Huh? Uh, sorry, at the end of April 2015. Uh, it was the moment where the, secreta the, 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 the Politburo, if you like, of Syriza, the Secretariat of the party, decided that the government should not pay back the International Monetary Fund. Because the, gov the Syriza government continued paying the IMF on time from January to uh, July. Seven billion went uh, to the uh, coffers of the, of the IMF. In April, uh, the situation was so dramatic that there was no cash anymore in the public coffers. Uh, and we knew that. Uh, and so the, uh, we decided that you know, what was in our program, should it, it was the time to implement it and say, no, we will not pay back the IMF. And, and we really start a confrontation huh, at, the, at that moment. And that was short-circuited in less than two days huh, by, by Tsipras and the people uh, around him. So we, we had leverage within instances that formerly were decision-making instances, but actually had lost their concrete, their effective power. And this is how Tsipras and his folks uh, bypassed uh, his own formation, his own party, and transformed it in you know, a rampage of uh, officials and, uh, and people who just hold public posts and, and, and so on. And you know, there, were, there are no militants, I and mean, it's not a militant party anymore. But do you think that this is an, this is an absolute limitation of a par parliamentary party? I mean, does, does the left in Europe need to look in, in the direction of parliamentarism, or it has to play with parliamentarism? Well, you know, we don't have the choice. I mean, we can't bypass, if we want to be active in politics, we can't bypass the parliamentary, uh, the parliamentary level. I mean, uh, this is a, a truth that was admitted by Marx and Engels themselves. Huh? I mean, you can read the whole set of texts written by Marx and Engels, particularly after the Paris Commune, uh, that are absolutely explicit that the way for socialists, and socialists at the time, and of course revolutionary socialists, uh, to access government is by winning elections and forming majorities. Huh? And the, you know, the very quick rise of German social democracy, don't be misled by the name, German social democracy before World War I was the party of Rosa Luxemburg, huh? it was the party of Karl Liebknecht, it was the party of uh, uh, the, the, the Marxist uh, uh, radical socialist party, although it had also a very strong reformist and moderate wing. Um, so um, German social democracy appeared as being on a position to contest and even to win elections. So that's the way to reach not power, governmental power. Huh? Being in government and being in power is not the same thing. Huh? Uh, political power in a society is a balance of class forces huh, that crystallizes in institutional realities. But the way to transform it uh, is to, uh, to, to break the deadlock, if you like, of governmental power. But of course, you need to articulate that with the dynamic of popular mobilization. Otherwise, well, uh, to put it bluntly, more fucked up. I mean, you know, in order to uh, it's it, the, the idea that only with you know uh, controlling a majority in parliament you can change uh, the balance of forces in this society is, is madness. Huh? Uh, it's only by, by establishing changing the balance of class forces within society that uh, things can can move on. Huh? Even for relatively limited changes, I'm not even talking about you know the big revolutionary break of changing property. Uh, relations of the means of production, etc. Even for more partial reforms, uh, you need a very high level of confrontation and popular mobilization, particularly now, because neoliberalism is alien uh, to a logic of compromise and um, uh, to, to, to a logic of class compromise. So you need a logic of popular mobilization. You need 
uh, the, the combination of both. You need, you know, the type of strategy that Gramsci uh, formulated as a protracted war of positions, but a war of positions that includes within it the war of movement, huh? the, the, you know, the moments of attack and the moments of frontal uh, confrontation as well. And so you need to articulate, you know, both parliamentary tactics and extra-parliamentary tactics uh, and, and win majorities in both uh, cases. Uh, you need uh, uh, to play with time and know that you are engaged in, in a protracted battle, but also be able to move decisively in order to defend yourself, huh? in order to protect uh, your own people from the attacks of your adversaries. Okay, now uh, before we open uh, discussion, just uh, the last uh, question, let us move to uh, this uh, region of ours. Uh, you and I were both uh, basically from the same regions, we call, we call it Balkans, and it's a, a very, very special uh, region in, in Europe. Um, in that five countries of, uh, of this region are not members of the European Union, uh, Croatia is not a member of, of Eurozone, um, but these bordering countries, Slovenia and Greece, uh, we are part of, part of both. Um, the, the future problems of, of, of this region will probably um, include uh, huge migration flows. Uh, we have seen this a uh, few years ago in Slovenia, and uh, the backlash was very right-wing. Uh, we did not expect this on, in, in the left, uh, the left wing of, of Slovenia did not expect uh, such a huge backlash. Um, so, how should we build uh, um, broad fronts, broad left wing fronts, or even socialist fronts in, in, in a country like that? Right. Okay. Yes, okay, it works. Okay, let, let, let me start by saying that uh, we should rehabilitate the name Balkans. Uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to be from that part of Europe. That's as simply as this. Uh, many people consider that you know, as, a, as, a, as an insult, uh, the Balkans, etc. This is a very big part of the problem uh, that uh, we are faced with as uh, peoples living in that uh, area of, uh, of, the, of the continent. And the, the fact that you know, we have internalized uh, the image uh, of us that is given by uh, the dominant discourses. Uh, the dominant powers uh, of Europe, everything that is uh, uh, grouped under the label of the West. Huh? Uh, the Balkans are a reality that, you know, it's in between. Huh? It's, it's, it's not totally East, East West, it's not, not totally East either. It has a certain number of specificities, it has a bit of both. Um, it's not, we are not Orientals and we are not castigated as Orientals in the sense that it would say it's sport of, sport of Orientalism, but there is a kind of Balkanism, huh? that is, you know, this very negative and evaluated image. And, and the, the, the crucial point here is that it has been accepted and internalized by the people uh, themselves. Huh? So it is a race to show that, you know, we are, no, no, we, we are not Balkans anymore, we are good Westerners, we have to compete with others to show, you know, who is the most Westernized, who is the most Western, etc. Th these are, you know, cultural stereotypes that represent for me uh, very serious cultural and political uh, impediments, actually, Build a proper radical and emancipatory alternative in all kinds of ways. Uh, the, the, the common position we share, and this is why Greece was also a kind of champion of Europeanism before the crisis 2008, huh? it is because uh, Europe and, and the EU has captured huh, illegitimately huh, the name of Europe. Uh, Europe and the EU are two different things, uh, we should not confuse. Uh, that, that there are big parts of, of Europe that are not uh, part of the EU, are leaving the EU. Don't tell me that the United Kingdom and Britain is not part of European history. It's a joke, of course. Uh, Russia, don't tell me that Russia is not part of, of, of Europe uh, as well. And then there are other, other examples. Well. So Europe and the EU are, are two different realities, but the EU somehow has, has succeeded in you know, monopolizing or kidnapping, as it were, uh, or hijacking the, uh, the, the, the name of Europe. But Europe, so Europe slash the EU, 
Appears as a promise of modernity, as a promise of prosperity, as a promise of openness to peripheral societies. And this is why the most pro EU societies and countries were the countries of the periphery. It's easier in a way you know, to contest somehow the hegemony of the dominant force when you are in the center than when you are in the periphery and you have accepted a kind of subaltern role. The reason is that if we accept this race, if we accept to compete on that terrain, we are doomed to reproduce our subalternity. And we need to break with that. And that will take a long time because it's not easy you know, to, uh, uh, to explain uh, uh, to uh, people who, to societies like you know, those who are now applying uh, to European membership that uh, uh, you know, the European Union hasn't, reached, uh, hasn't brought much good uh, to uh, the countries and particularly the peripheries uh, for joined that it has widened the gap, that it has led okay, to all the things we have uh, mentioned before. And in order to do that, we need alternatives. We need an alternative vision. And I think that one of the biggest differences between, let's say, to simplify, the left in Europe and the left in Latin America is that the left in Latin America, although, you know, very patriotic left, because we are talking about societies that have been oppressed and are oppressed by imperialism. Huh? When you are in Latin America, you feel the pressure of imperialism. Imperialism is there absolutely everywhere, from Mexico to Patagonia. Huh? Uh, U.S. imperialism is really uh, the, the, the major enemy of uh, any emancipatory uh, effort in that continent. But at the same time, that patriotic left defending national sovereignty against imperialism had a vision that went and goes beyond the national boundaries. Huh? A, a, a vision of Latin America. Huh? A vision of Latin America such as, you know, the Bolivarian vision of Patria de Andre. Huh? Uh, the Cuban revolution, the genuine internationalist revolution, always tried to expand somehow and to help and to bring, you know, uh, in all kinds of ways, even uh, materially, and first and foremost materially, uh, revolutionary movements and efforts across the continent. The European left lacks this. And one of the reasons it lacks this is that it has been trapped and ideologically subordinated to the dominant strategy of the European dominant classes, which is the European project, the EU. As long as uh, the left in Europe remains trapped in Variants of Europeanism, the, the belief that you know somehow the EU represents a progress that can be improved and, 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 and so on and so forth, there will be no space for an alternative discourse, and the rising revolt against the EU will be captured, hegemonized, and monopolized by the radical right. Okay, thank you very much, ladies. Uh, now to the questions. Anyone from the public has any questions? Encourage more. Be more encouraged no, with questions and, and comments. I know some people have, have it because they, they talk to me for. Hello? Should I rise up? So no, 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 I will rise up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will. No, I will move over there, okay, so now I can see. So it's uh, quite fascinating that your experience with the uh, Syriza left is quite similar to ours, our experience here in Slovenia. Uh, please, I find that the similarities when you said that the meetings you had and the, 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 it was changed name and he was in the public and the, and the meeting, he felt the hostility. I mean, it's quite fascinating that I have a similar experience in that regard. The question I want to pose is, uh, uh, the title of this panel is uh, The Left in Labyrinth, and I'm interested, many see Corbyn as some kind of messiah who will bring us out of the labyrinth. Do, do you see him as a messiah? And did he find the exit from the labyrinth? Thank you. Can we take more, perhaps, questions and interventions and to, to you know, liberate somehow the, the initiative of the, of the floor? Anyone else? I have a minimalistic question. You come from King's College. What happened to the cleaners over there? 
Uh, he's not, you know, the Mélenchon, Pablo Iglesias, Caudillo. He's exactly the contrary of that. Uh, he's very anti-populist in his style, in his personal ethos, if you like. And I find this combination very interesting. Having said this, the Labour Party is the Labour Party, and the Labour Party is one of, is an institution of British society. It is social democracy. It's not that it will never become a kind of militant party of uh, the radical left. But within the Labour Party, uh, you have a space that is built for the genuine left uh, that hasn't existed in Britain since the 80s, uh, since the defeat of the Minor Strike. So it's really, you know, a, a historical turning point, and it's an opportunity that, by you know, any means, should not be missed. To go ahead, um, the cleaners at KCL. Well, it's an ongoing issue, obviously. Uh, you know, there, there have been important mobilizations of cleaners in many uh, institutions in uh, London, in Britain, uh, including my own at a neighboring institution, which is a bit kind of the most left-wing, probably, uh, academic institution in London, so as the cleaners have won after a strike. Um, in our institution, they went on strike um, uh, the, in spring 2017. Uh, they went on a shorter strike uh, now, and we have succeeded, I mean, uh, you, you might be aware that we had the longest strike of academic teachers in the UK in March. Uh, it lasted 14 working days spread across four weeks, uh, so it was the longest industrial action in, in higher education in the country. And during, in the picket lines and uh, during the, the struggle actually, it was a very militant struggle, uh, the, the first of that time actually in higher education in, in Britain by far. Uh, we had cleaners uh, uh, coming to the picket lines, addressing our uh, rallies, and we have built a common platform of demands internally that we put to management. And one of the key uh, dimensions of it is that uh, the management of our institution should stop outsourcing uh, those activities and bring them back in-house. So, having the cleaners being treated as equally as employees of King's College and not by a subcontractor which, you know, uh, uh, offers absolutely appalling paying and working uh, conditions to these people. This is extremely important in order to bring a sense of a political and social struggle that goes beyond corporate demands. So I think that uh, we have made a very substantial progress in the course of our collective action uh, that we had in uh, the spring uh, by building in practice and now uh, fighting this battle together with uh, the union of uh, the cleaners and with uh, the people, uh, the people themselves. Now, how to avoid nationalism and xenophobia? Well, you know, if I had a solution to that uh, kind of you know, ready-made recipe, I don't know, it would be a, a kind of political genius. It's obviously a very complicated uh, affair. And uh, one of the most uh, negative consequences of um, the demoral demoralization that was brought by the capitulation of Syriza is uh, the rise of nationalism that we have been witnessing in Greece uh, with the kind of restart of uh, the negotiations with uh, Macedonia around the issue of so-called the name uh, of Macedonia. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very worried uh, by this because uh, you, had, you have the same actors that we have seen uh, in previous moments uh, in history agitating against any uh, solution to that naming dispute. Uh, with a completely absurd and irrational nationalist lines, such as you know, no compromise Macedonia, we have you know, the monopoly of the name, and any entity uh, with the name of Macedonia represents almost a kind of existential uh, threat to Greece. So this is, you know, these are fringes of the political uh, spectrum, uh, but they have succeeded in, in, in the past and now having a broader impact and bringing with them people in a state of confusion, in a state of disarray, and in a state of anger by channeling you know, the, the popular anger in that direction. This is very dangerous, of course. Huh? 
you know, so the left has been destroyed by, from within by Syriza and its uh, leaders. Uh, and the popular anger is now captured to a certain extent by those nationalist fringes who say, you know, Cyprus is ready to sell out the country. Selling out the country is also what we say, but when we say he sells out the country, he mean, we mean very concretely he's, privat he's privatizing public activities, okay? He's uh, submitting to the dictates of the Troika. Uh, this is what we mean by selling out the country, uh, not selling out the country by negotiating a uh, solution to an absurd disputes with um, uh, the Republic of, of, uh, of Macedonia, obviously. Um, one of the ways we should you know, reconnect, actually, with our own history and complex and very fragmented and very uh, painful in certain aspects, uh, Balkan identity, is that you know, we should be able to explain history huh? to, 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 our, to, to our people and, and you know, engage in a discussion with them. Huh? Uh, we should uh, explain, you know, why, uh, how our nation states have been built, you know, and the fact that uh, the, the idea that Macedonia is a kind of uh, continuity between Alexander the Great and uh, now is uh, nuts, I mean, completely, huh? but, you know, what happened in the Balkan Wars, uh, how practices of ethnic cleansing have been implemented on all sides, uh, uh, including, of course, uh, Greece, uh, how we were led to those realities, what it means, what are the scars of history. I mean, you know, there is a very traumatic history for the Greek left uh, around Macedonia, because for uh, certain moments in history, the Greek Communist Party was in favor of the secession of uh, Macedonia. And disastrous, disastrously, it brought back this line at the very last phase of the civil war, huh? uh, also in order to counter uh, the fact that after the break of, uh, between Tito and Stalin, Tito was developing his own networking in uh, the Macedonian organization of uh, the Communist Party in, in, in Greece. Um, and any uh, position in favor of secession at the moment of civil war meant that, you know, for the communists who were arrested and put in jail and usually sentenced to death and usually shot. But if, if after that, there was almost no need of a trial. There was no, no need to prove that they had a concrete you know, activity and involvement in uh, the operations of the, of the civil war. The sheer fact that they were supporting a position of secession uh, was sufficient to lead them to the execution squad directly. So thousands of people were shot huh, because uh, they, they, they they had as members, as loyal militants of the Communist Party to support uh, a completely wrong uh, position, particularly at that moment, uh, 19, uh, early, early 1949 to the summer of uh, 1949. So, you know, we, we have, the, the, these things are very little known, uh, e e even among, you know, I, I discovered that belatedly, I have to say. Uh, and, you know, I was a member of the Communist Youth since the age of 15 in Greece. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, we had quite open discussions about many aspects of the, uh, the, the history of, of the party, but this remained out of focus, as it were, for a very long time. So we should, you know, one of the reasons why we should, in a way, reclaim that identity is not reclaiming, you know, uh, uh, it has many positive aspects as well, right? It's a, a history, of course, of, you know, popular struggles, of struggles for national liberation, for emancipation, for, uh, for revolution, but, but, of course, it has all these dark moments huh, about which we also need. You, you can't have the one without the other, hmm? but it works both ways, huh? you see. It's not, I mean, we need to be open about these things, I think, in order to build a kind of new type of internationalist uh, uh, structure. One last thing about migration, because I don't want to be too long. Uh, we shouldn't uh, be um, ashamed of claiming national sovereignty. Uh, it's a mistake for the left to be opposed, to oppose, you know, uh, as uh, total, total contradictory terms, internationalism and national sovereignty. We need to recapture national sovereignty, but for, for our goals, for our agenda. We need to recapture a moment of national sovereignty because we want, as political parties of the left, to implement our programs and to defend our agenda even when we are in power. And if we do not do that, 
then we will act like an Alexis Tsipras. We want to recapture national sovereignty also to break with fortress Europe. I mean, let me put it this way, the only positive, very limited in time, and even in, in its, in its uh, uh, scope, positive gesture of any European government vis-a-vis -vis the migrants was the gesture of Angela Merkel. And she did that because, you know, it is Germany. And Germany has, of course, a level of sovereignty. And at some point, they, uh, Merkel said, yes, the migrants will come and we are us. Huh? We will, uh, will fix it. Huh? Uh, of course, she retreated shortly after because it's Merkel. It's not, it's not the left. But, you know, <laughs> it, it, she, she was able to do that because she had the control of, you know, what was happening in the country. So, the logic is the logic of a unilateral disobedience to the existing anti-democratic, xenophobic, racist, imperial, neoliberal European Union. And that means that, you know, you break, you start the break from your own country and then, of course, you expand it huh? uh, in, in, uh, in all kinds of ways by the sheer force of, that, of you know, providing um, a, an example somehow that will inspire people and that will boost struggles and, and hopes elsewhere. Now, the experience of, the, of popular unity and the mistakes uh, we made. Look, um, uh, let me start with an obvious m mistake. We, we challenged the leadership of Cyprus and, of, of, of and, and its legitimacy when it was too late, first of all. We had to prepare uh, for having alternative leadership figures. Uh, or let me put it this way, Cyprus is not, you know, it's, Cyprus is not anyone. Huh? We shouldn't underestimate huh? people who have become our adversaries, who we didn't start that. Huh? He's a very clever practitioner and politician. One of his, one aspect of his, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the demonic aspects of, of his intelligence is that he knew how to manipulate people. Huh? But in fact, he conveys that sense quite vividly huh, in his text, and huh? how he tells to different people what they want to hear from them. Huh? And he, he brings, I mean, I, I had direct experience from that myself, huh? so I can, but since I'm a uh, mention of fact, because he's an important figure, he's not a fair um, So, um, so we, we, that, that, you know, was one of our mistakes. The second mistake is that um, we didn't present an alternative roadmap early enough in the procedure. And we didn't do that, I know why we didn't do that. Because we had decided actually in the conference of the platform to do that. And we didn't do that because we knew that to do that we should put in balance our positions in the cabinet. So we should, we should have been ready to resign from the cabinet if an alternative roadmap to a road that was already paving, you know, the way to the disaster uh, when that was, uh, had become visible. And that became visible after the agreement of February the 20th and the surrender, the first surrender to the Euro group. Um, the third mistake uh, we made is that we, we played the count of party loyalty where it didn't make sense anymore. And, you know, in, in politics, as you know, there are days and weeks that count as much as whole years. I think it's Lenin who said that a single day of the French Revolution is, uh, uh, carries as much weight as a whole you know, year or decade of normal political development. So in the crucial two months between the capitulation of, of mid-July and the early elections, we left Tsipras played what was his major advantage, which was the control of the agenda, inside and outside the party. So we, we didn't uh, articulate, if you like, properly uh, these, two, uh, these two dimensions. We were trapped in a kind of internal game at the moment in which this internal game was insufficient to really have an impact and to make, to, to make a difference. This is a limitation of every internal opposition. I have to say here, you know, there is a French expression that you have to sweep in front of your own door. Right? You need to start doing this. Uh, the other components of the, of the Greek radical left also bear a heavy responsibility in this. 
because instead we repeatedly tried as a left platform to build before 2015, during, 2000, during this whole battle, bridges with the Communist Party. Uh, uh, the bulk of our cadres and, and members come from the Communist Party, and sometimes you know the, it's the same families. Uh, the Communist Party in Greece, in Greece split two times, twice in '68 and in '99. So you know there are there are many common connections. They, they categorically refuse. They just use constantly a very sectarian uh, uh, language uh, all, all the way around. Um, the, the far left is different in the sense that you know it was possible with the far left coalition of us here to build unit in action, in concrete, and, and, and the commerce have been superb, I have to say, in the campaign, uh, in, the, in the lead up to the referendum. But they persistently refuse any political discussion, and any discussion at the level of, you know, having, building something at the proper political level in common. Huh? So the whole logic was that we were competitors, and you know what the logic of competition means. Huh? The closest to you becomes the main, is seen as the main obstacle because we were the obstacle to supposedly the radicalization of the masses and we were the alibi of Cyprus, etc. And we had to be unmasked as being the alibi of, of, of Cyprus. And okay, when the whole thing collapsed, it's not their turn that came. It's not the, the, the genuine revolutionaries that, you know, somehow took the leadership out of the fallen hands of, of the dirty reformists and, and so on. It's the entire left that collapsed and, and it's an entire people and entire society that was demoralized. Huh? So it's not only our failure, huh? it's also their failure. Huh? But I, I think I have been sufficiently self-critical in order to uh, be allowed in a way to articulate some criticism of, of, the, of the left. It, it's a broader failure. I mean, it's, uh, it's a wider one. Um, I would actually like to ask you something because this was very, uh, it really touched me, I guess, when uh, I was listening to you talk in Zagreb, is what are the consequences of the cities of failure? You were talking about Greece today and the state of its internal affairs, uh, how everything is basically not under the command of the government anymore at all, and how they're implementing, like, they were, they were uh, campaigning on uh, stopping like the <clears throat> the banks taking their homes and now they're implementing laws uh, prohibiting protesters to actually stop this so if you could elaborate a little bit on, on this or tell everyone here as well because that's a very painful lesson to hear what happens when you fail like cities of it perhaps perhaps some some last questions and uh, last so, um, in the beginning, uh, you mentioned that Greece, like uh, Italy today, was a weak economic link in the EU. In, in a recent EU Commission report, the Commission pushed uh, the Slovenian government um, for privatization of public companies uh, raising uh, retirement age. So. Uh, basically neoliberal policies. So uh, the question is, do you think Slovenia could, uh, in case of uh, um, economic crisis, uh, next economic crisis, uh, have a Greece-like scenario which could open a uh, maneuver space in the Slovenian lab? Sorry, can, can you repeat the last part of your question? Because I didn't get it. Um, do you think Slovenia could, in case of a uh, economic crisis which you know, will probably happen, and uh, uh, can Slovenia have a Greece-like scenario, a scenario comparable to Greece in the 2010-2012 um, um, years? Thank you, that's for a lecture. I would return to something that you were saying about Italy. You said that the Five Star uh, Movement represents uh, sui generis popul say, sui generis populism. Can you, uh, what do you mean by that? And do you think that there are lessons to be drawn from this sui generis populism for the left?
Uh, just said earlier that uh, one of the reasons of the impotence of the left in Europe is uh, the inability to articulate the breaking from the European Union, and uh, I mean I agree with that. Uh, but I think the reason is actually the fear of what would happen if a national country, especially one as small as Slovenia, would decide to leave the European Union and to leave the euro currency. And I think that that fear is actually very legitimate. Um, because, you know, I mean, we've been talking about the plan B and we've been discussing it, but I've never actually heard anywhere from anyone what exactly would that plan be that would be better for the people of a national country than staying in the EU. Disaster is unprecedented by uh, standards of uh, uh, any Western um, uh, European country. Uh, uh, Greece has lost about 27% of its GDP. It has about 21% of unemployment. Youth unemployment is uh, 48%. Uh, a third of the population is exposed to extreme poverty. It's the third worst rate in Europe. Uh, only Romania and Bulgaria have worse figures in uh, poverty measures than, uh, so Slovenia is above Greece, huh? so even Jebel as well as many others. Uh, the situation of basic public services is absolutely appalling. I mean, you know, Greek hospitals have been uh, termed as danger zones um, by uh, foreign media. Uh, and uh, nearly uh, three quarter of a million people living in Greece before the crisis have left the country nearly half a million Greeks, uh, most of them young, 70% of them holding uh, higher education degrees, so the, bet, the, best educate, the best educated generation in the history of the country uh, has left. And this is depriving, as you understand, a lot of the potential energy for struggles and protests uh, as well. And I find them in, in London. I mean, like, uh, I could talk about that, about the experience of my, the neighborhood I'm living in in London, which used to be a Greek secret neighborhood up to the 1970s, and now is Hellenicized because you have people not from Cyprus, but from mainland Greece now coming there to get jobs and so on. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really a, a total disaster. But uh, what I, uh, what I to, to refer to what uh, Tonya was um, uh, saying, uh, I put emphasis uh, on, on, on two aspects. The first is the reshaping of the fabric of the Greek state by the Troika. Uh, I've written a long piece uh, that came out in the last issue of the New Left Review. It's on free access, uh, which is called Borderland, Greece and the EU South of Question, which tries to articulate an analysis of the Greek situation from the standpoint of the so-called migrant crisis, and its role in that, and, and from the standpoint of its laboratory of new liberalism and trying to uh, propose a concept of state form that somehow makes the connection between these two, uh, these two dimensions, a kind of uh, something that could be uh, labeled as uh, <coughs> authoritarian neoliberalism of the periphery, if you like, or, or internal colonialism. So what you have to understand is that it's not only extreme austerity that has been implemented with the usual recipes, uh, privatizing all the public and facilities. I mean, it's the series of government that has privatized the ports of the country. I mean, the port of 30% have been privatized before Syriza being into power, but the 70% of the rest has been privatized to the Chinese, and it has become what uh, the people there call coastland. Uh, it's a special economic zone. I mean, it's, it's, it's a zone where Greek legislation doesn't apply. Uh, it's totally, it, it's, it's a coastland state. Uh, the, the, the ports have been privatized, the water has been privatized. Um, 
uh, electricity has been privatized. They are now selling the power plants. I mean, it's madness. It's madness. Uh, so, um, but the, the Greek state is deprived, actually, of all its means of action. Um, it's not only the programs that you know, set the fiscal targets and so on, it's the mechanism, the institution, and the agency that collects the tax revenue that has now become independent and actually directly controlled by the Troika because it's ruled by a board of five members and uh, two of them are directly appointed by the Troika and the three others, including the, the, the head of the board, have to be approved by the Troika. So they are controlling the mechanism of collecting taxes. This is, un I mean, so you understand that when, when I'm talking of internal colonialism, uh, it's, I, I mean, I really mean it. It's not, you know, rhetorical stuff, etc. You know, just as a reminder, the American War of Independence started with uh, the term no taxation without representation. Uh, so they, they were against taxes imposed by the colonial metropolis, which was Britain uh, uh, at the time. So we are talking about something that is denying the fundamentals of modern bourgeois states, if you like. I mean, for God's sake. Um, and and similar, similarly for uh, the other key institutions of the Greek state. Of course, there is no monetary sovereignty. Everything is controlled by, by Frankfurt. But even the Agency for Statistics is directly controlled by the Troika because everything is functions around the same pattern. Huh? The Council for Fiscal Discipline. Uh, that is a, a, a special body that was put in place and, and, and can decide about budgetary cuts if there is suspicion that the fiscal targets of extraordinary, extortionary surpluses uh, will not be met. The decisions of that council of fiscal discipline, an unelected body, have equal value with decrees of the cabinet, of the government. And that has been passed. By, 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 by a law, a special law by the Greek Parliament. So the, the Greek Parliament is a joke. Yeah? I mean, from the start of the memoranda, the memoranda are 1,000 pages long documents. Huh? Uh, they, they have been approved after a parliamentary debate of four, 24 to 48 hours. And it's the Troika that fixes the deadline. Huh? You know, they, they said when Tsipras uh, signed the, uh, uh, the agreement, uh, uh, definitely, you know, the, the, the document itself, uh, he had five days to pass it on Parliament with a specific time. So the Parliament had to convene uninterruptedly for 24 hours in, in, in a farce of, of, of a debate in order to approve a document which its main pieces were in English. They, they, they didn't even translate that into Greek. So, can you imagine, I mean, the political situation we, we are in? We knew that. We knew that, you know, this kind of supreme humiliation uh, would, would happen if we, uh, uh, if we would lose the battle, and, and, and we lost it. <laughs> uh, finally, um, because it's completely subservient, of course, to the Troika, the government has passed a series of laws to confront potential and actually existing forms of social protest. So, because the Greek banks are very heavily handicapped and actually non-viable, despite you know, 40 billion of recapitalization. By the way, they have been sold by the Syriza government to speculative hedge funds for 4 billion, huh? after being recapitalized by 40 billion. Huh? So the people who did that, of course, should be put on trial if any notion of bourgeois justice uh, existed. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in Greece. Uh, but they are, had, they, they are still non viable because they have 44% of uh, their assets are so called non performing loans. It was you know, the easy credit that was given during the period of the, of, of the bubble, and now people cannot, businesses or, or, or private uh, or individuals cannot repay the, the credits they, they got in the period. So, what was imposed by the Troika is a policy of massive home and business repossessions. Uh, so the law that protected the homes of the people to be repossessed by banks, which was voted, mind you, by the PASOK, the Social Democratic Government, shortly before the, the first memorandum in late 2009, was de facto 
uh, abolished. So the, these uh, assets are now, these homes are now, um, uh, you know, publicly somehow, uh, how do you say that, on sale. Uh, initially, it had to happen in, in courts. The procedure had to be, you know, approved somehow by a court decision, huh? because it was a legal dispute between uh, the, the debtor and the, the, the bank. Uh, but in courts, uh, activists were mobilizing and preventing the, the procedure from happening. So the Troika said, okay, it's not working, and it's very bad for the image because, of course, the police, had, the police had to intervene, and, you know, we had tear gases in, in courts happening in Greece and so on. That was not good for the image of the government. So it would happen online, online. So it happens in, in uh, offices of uh, a special category of lawyers and notaries, I think it's called uh, in, in English, that you know, do these kind of things or accept doing these kind of things. So you still have activists uh, regrouping outside those offices. So this is not enough. So you have to pass a special law, a special law uh, uh, sentencing from three to six months of prison to any person specifically preventing a sales and the home repossession from happening. This is unseen. Plus the fact that, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the laws that were, Greece had the most favorable to the exercise of strike action laws in, in Western Europe until recently. These laws were passed in the first socialist government in the early 80s in, in, in Greece. They were abolished by a government of formerly the radical left. And now you have, you know, the Thatcher-inspired labor legislation that, you know, you need to convene an internal vote, you need to have a, a threshold of participation, you need to have a 50 plus 1 uh, vote of the membership in order to start the strike, you, you, you need, of course, to make notice of that long in advance, and so on. I mean, you know, all, all these ways that have been uh, uh, very severely restricting uh, industrial action. You know, I've been working in the UK since now nearly a couple of decades. I, I, I know directly what I'm talking um, about. Um, the sui generis uh, populism of the Cinque Stelle. Look, to, to cut in a way a long story short, it is sui generis because usually, I mean, to simplify, we can distinguish between self-declared left-wing populist parties, for them, for instance, and right-wing populist parties. Uh, let's say, um, uh, Swedish uh, Democrats. Uh, I'm sure that we have the equivalent here in, uh, in, in uh, Slovenia. Uh, the National Front is a different story because it has roots in French fascism, in the French fascist, fascist tradition. But, I mean, usually you can distinguish between left-wing and right-wing versions of populism. Cinque Stelle escapes to a certain extent that uh, division, uh, not, not only in terms of its program, but also in terms of its constituencies. There are many constituencies, if you like, that have been grouped over Cinque Stelle. Uh, but a lot of people come, of course, from mainstream, uh, uh, apolitical, bourgeois, uh, uh, right-wing, uh, broad conservative, broadly speaking backgrounds, but you have sectors of, of left-leaning people that have joined uh, Cinque Stelle. Yeah? In Turin, for instance, in the, in the city of Turin, uh, they, they have the, the city, they control the city council, and it's, it's people coming from social movements and from the city left, in a way, that, that, that are in Cinque Stelle. It's also the case in some places in southern Italy uh, as well. But you see, Italy is a society that is still deeply traumatized by the, the collapse of its communist party. Uh, this still uh, has a, a, a completely depressing effect on, on the entire Italian left. Uh, and and it, it, is a, it is a Greek story, actually, because, you know, the collapse came from within. Right? You know, people, I mean, adversaries would never have been able to inflict such damage had not the damage been inflicted by, from, from within, uh, by people coming from within. This is absolutely devastating. It's very difficult, you know, to cope with that. I mean, there are people I know in Greece since my high school years, with whom, you know, I've been politically active as, as a high school student, then as a student, etc., who are now complicit with all these horrors I've been, I've been talking about. Uh, it's not, I mean, easy in a way to, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I've been, um, uh, so they, they, they now uh, boast and appear as, uh, you know, the victors and so on. Um, uh, what would happen? Fear. Fear, of course. 
Of course, fear is a big thing. Fear is a big thing. But you see, fear is the outcome of the fact that the idea of the break is a taboo. It's something that is beyond imagination. I mean, uh, let, let me quote this uh, uh, moment. Huh? Um, shortly after a particularly humiliating meeting of the Eurogroup, Varoufakis had already been kicked out, and Sakalotos, the current finance minister, had taken over. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the commission came with an extremely humiliating plan, etc. And it was clear that we were leading to a crisis. It was in late May, early June, and, you know, the referendum came as a consequence of that. Paul Mason, a well-known British journalist, still working for the BBC, I think, at the time, did an interview with Sakalotos. He's still somewhere on, on, on YouTube. And um, Mason asked Sakalotos what would happen if... Greece exits the euro, and his reply was uh, Weimar 1930s. So why? I mean, let's put the logic to the end because you know we have to put things to their limit. So exiting the euro is Auschwitz. This is what it means. What this reveals is, you know, that it's beyond imagination. It's taboo. You know, the world will collapse. And, 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 he, and he pursued after by similar metaphors. It would be nuclear war. It would be, you know, this kind. These people were unable to articulate uh, a rational plan for something that was, in a way, a common secret that it was a very serious eventuality huh, that would happen. So, economists, serious economists, huh, my, my friend, colleague, and comrade, and of course, and Heinrich Flasbeck, had worked at the time. And, uh, an alternative proposal with specific measures about, you know, how to deal with issues of currency, with exports, and so on. You need some kind of international alliances. Hmm? We knew that. We ha I have to say that, you know, there was a, an internal joke in 2012 when we narrowly, you know, missed the, the majority. I see the, the we means the series of 2012, obviously. Um, that the only um, people who are prepared for a series of government in Athens are the, is the Venezuelan embassy. <laughs> uh, it's not a joke, guys. I mean, I, I, I was totally, because uh, the, the, the head of the international department of Syriza was a member of the left uh, platform, I was extremely impressed and, and very deeply moved uh, by uh, the way uh, Cuba and Venezuela, by other embassies, were moving in Athens at, at the time. They were very serious. I mean, you know, there were plans, you know, Oil, because you know, oil, you need hard currency yeah, to pay oil. Yeah? So we will give you oil, I mean, we will uh, uh, we'll see how, what we can do for credit. I mean, you know, Cubans say that we can mediate with the Chinese. I mean, you know, we, you, you need these kind of things uh, as well. And finally, because this is an ongoing uh, debate in which I'm, I'm also involved, uh, there have been European meetings for Plan B. Mm -hmm. So there have been so far three of them. So with people coming, you know, the spectrum covers from uh, Varoufakis and uh, uh, Mélenchon to, to us, Popular Unity, and, uh, and, and, and other people as well. And now we have uh, put in place with uh, Costas Lapavitsas and uh, the Belgian uh, campaigner Eric Toussaint. Eric Toussaint is a Belgian campaigner uh, who has played a very important role in the whole battle against the repayment of sovereign debts. He was uh, very crucial in the Ecuadorian Commission for the Public for a Citizen's Audit of the Debt. And he was put in charge in Greece in 2015 by the then president of the Greek Parliament, Zoe Kostantopoulou, who was on the left uh, wing of the, of the party uh, as well. Uh, he was in charge of uh, the expertise for the Greek Commission for uh, an audit of the Greek debt or, or, or the sovereign Greek debt. And so he has been very involved in the Greek battle and in Greek politics, and he's a very internationalist activist uh, by essence. His network exists in dozens of, of, of countries. So we have built a network that is called Recommons Europe, uh, with trying to cover you know, the spectrum of all the progressive forces, not only parties, but also we are interested in attracting, and we have regroup trade unionists, campaigners, people from social movements, in order to articulate specific and serious 
uh, alternative proposals, e even you know, with technicalities when, when it is needed, huh? because you know, we need to address you know, the issue of banking system. You know? I mean, we, without retaking control of the banking system, you, you can't even have a serious talk of an alternative policy. And this means you know, direct confrontation with the ECB, blah, blah. It's, it has gone even beyond the euro issue, although the euro remains, a, of course, a very important uh, uh, deadlock here. Right, okay. This one. Did I? <laughs> About Slovenia and. Oh, yes. Look, I mean, j j just to clarify, you mean a left wing scenario in Slovenia? Uh, no, I mean, it's more like uh, um, the economic situation. Uh huh. Right. I mean, you know, the, the difference always, I mean, you have. Many countries have experienced uh, a very serious uh, economic downturn. Huh? What makes the difference is uh, the level of popular mobilization in that context. What triggered a left-wing dynamic in Greece was the fact that the country experienced you know, an absolutely massive wave of popular mobilization. This, this changed you know, the consciousness of the masses, as we say. Uh, this is what allowed the bulk of the electorate that was previously loyal to the to social democracy to move further to the left. I, I was there during you know, the peak of the mobilization of the occupation of the squares. It was extremely impressive to see that happening at really a mass level. Huh? So uh, economic downturns can have always very sharp effects at the political level, but not always in the same direction. The crucial parameter that allows to fuel either a right-wing or <laughs> radicalization or, or a left-wing radicalization is popular mobilization, of course. Huh? So you can very well have, like Italy, who lives in a kind of protracted situation of stagnation and, uh, and economic uh, immiseration, if you like, uh, you can have a, a right-wing uh, dynamic developing because the level of popular mobilization, of struggles, of social movements, of, of worker struggles is, has been very low throughout that, that period. Huh? So we absolutely need to understand how political dynamics are shaped from below, if I may say so, by uh, social movements and mobilizations. Although social movements and mobilizations can also be helped and triggered by positive developments happening at the political level. Uh, you know, the fact that in Greece we had a political space left of social democracy, a limited but still an existing one, certainly contributed to the fact that you know, people took to the streets and occupied places and because, of course, there is a long tradition of popular struggle, of popular resistance and, and so on. So we need to be very, you know, to put absolute priority uh, to uh, uh, mass mobilization and, and, and collective action when we have the sense that somehow things cannot continue the way they, 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 they are uh, in a certain moment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now just a closing remark or two from a, a chairwoman you said. This is like a ad hoc, so. Uh, no, first I would like to thank you, Status, for responding very quickly and for taking the time to come here. We're very gr uh, grateful for you to come, to have come. And I guess I would like to thank all of you for coming as well. And I would like to thank all of you for coming as well. So, all this has a cost, including my ticket and the hospitality of comrades. So, put money over there, huh? you will not get that that easy. Huh? So, put money over there. <laughs>